for us and all of your customers, each and every one in this room who chose to place your trust in us to run your business on Zoho. And if you are someone who is exploring Zoho for the first time, thank you to you two for giving us a try. So um, with that said, the last Zoholics we ever had was in the year 2017, three years ago, and it was in Mumbai. We had about 1,000 audience come join us for the event. And then, sorry, 2019, thank you for correcting that. 2019, we've been in, I mean, there's been a small gap. We weren't able to do it for the past two years. Small things happened, like the global pandemic. <laughs> but in all seriousness, though, I know the pandemic meant a lot of personal loss, financial challenges, emotional challenges for most of us here. It is the same, and we are all able to relate to that. But what the pandemic also meant was immense resilience from the whole of humanity. I mean, if history is of any reference, we can see that us humans, we are quite good at change. When things come to us, when things change abruptly, even at a global level, like a global pandemic, we rise up to the occasion. We may think that we won't, like, up. Anxiety may be high, the imagined fear may be high, but when presented with the moment of challenge, we rise up to it and we meet it. So I would like to say that we not just survived the pandemic, but we also thrived through it. Because look at the things that it changed for good. Remote work wasn't even a concept. I mean, remotely a concept. But today, we've accepted it, we've adopted int that into our work culture. So um, lovely to be able to see you all once again in person like this in flesh and bones. Thank you so much once again. With that said, let's move to the first session of today, the session that you are most awaiting, which I am too, by the man who needs no introduction because for some people, the name alone is enough with immense pleasure and great honor, may I please call upon a beloved CEO and founder of Zoho Corporation, Sridhar Vembo, onto the stage, please. morning I guess this is what Bangalore traffic looks like <laughs> people are still slowly trickling in and if we waited I think it will be 10 30 11 before we truly get going so we have to get started we like to keep some time in Zoho I mean we don't ship products on time but at least we like to run our events on time <laughs> so uh, it's actually good to have these uh, physical events. In fact, we also, along with it, we rediscovered that offices are kind of nice. <laughs> that, you know, and most of our workforce, maybe about 90% are actually back in the office. And uh, that excludes me, you know, I'm, I'm working in a farm now. I have I've built a small office now. I've got a few people I'm working with, but most of our staff actually are now in some office or the other, we are building more uh, hubs now. But uh, we think what is going to happen is that mostly it will be like a hub and spoke where you will have offices in the vicinity of where your most people are and, and then maybe some smaller spokes where small offices like maybe five augmented with work from home. In other words, even you know, something like Bangalore will require two or three or four hubs right? So big. So you don't want to funnel everybody into one place, but maybe three or four hubs and then spokes. That is how I think it's going to evolve. Because there are real advantages to having an office. That is, how do you bring new people on board? And how do you, you know, get people into a culture? So these are some of the topics you know, I'm going to talk about today, the cultural aspect of a company and what does it mean in a in a world that is evolving. So let's get started. Okay. 
So this is my building for the long haul. And in a time like this, where we are maybe on the cusp of a global recession, is a time to take stock and examine what are we really in for. And this would be maybe the third major downturn we are facing as a company. We lived through the 2001 bust, then of course the global financial crisis, eight and nine. So that has given us some uh, idea. And first thing is, obviously going into it, nobody believes that any such crisis is ever going to strike. But even as of 2000, I was aware, because I had studied Japan in 1989-90. In fact, I'm going to talk about Japan, because there's a lot of lessons from Japan that I guess China wishes they had learnt. And I hope that India doesn't wish 20 years from now that we had learnt. <laughs> so. And of course, last uh, two years we had the pandemic, then the monster bubble, biggest I have seen, and I've seen like two, three bubbles before, then the inflation, particularly inflation in the advanced countries, the Western world, much higher than India inflation. India inflation has been reasonably mild com uh, by comparison. And the war, of course, and the great resignation that so many companies saw. So it feels like uh, we have gone through a big decade already, and it's been only two years. And in fact, I am afraid we are going to go through a quite a decade ahead, actually, given the, what forces are up. And this is what we started with. When the pandemic struck, on the very first month, I remember, this was in April, and you know, end of March, April, the lockdown started, and the business seemed to go into a tailspin, right? Suddenly you'll see you know, a huge downturn. I mean, you're going at a full speed and then screeching halt across the board. And, uh, but we made two resolutions then, actually. I made a post in March of 2020 as our employees. We were the very first company to lock down. And uh, so we assured our employees that we will avoid layoffs at any cost. This is something that uh, I made an assurance in March of 2020. And uh, the second, we also very soon, within a month or two, we announced this emergency subscription assistance because we saw our customers hurting worldwide. So we announced this. About maybe 15, 20,000 worldwide customers took advantage of it. And uh, but this, why I mentioned this is, this is how we acted when in faced with that extreme uncertainty of the pandemic. Because at that, you have to remember the March, April time frame. Everything was shutting down. It wasn't clear what was going to happen, right? But this is what we did. We said, over hard it is, we'll pull through it somehow. And uh, there's no point in, you know, this layoff I don't believe in because it's, you know, we have to share the hardship. That's what I said. And second, customers, we will we'll share the hardship with the customers. So of, we'll share the hardship of the customers. So that is what we thought. And, and then this, actually, in 2021, we actually, without marketing, we gained a lot of customers. All those customers became our marketing channel, too. In fact, in 2021, our business skyrocketed back. And, uh, and of course, uh, there was a worldwide boom, too. But along with it, we saw... Uh, and, but what was interesting is this was all profitable growth. We didn't have to spend much in marketing. In fact, we had pretty much turned off a lot of our online marketing in 2020. We didn't actually turn it back on in 2021. Because we thought, you know, we'll, we'll see how much money we were wasting. <laughs> so, and now 2023 and beyond. So what is ahead? Well, I tell you, we cannot, nobody can truly know 100%, right? But, but we can determine what, what, what is, is, how are we, we responsible to those ones on internal, internal values, 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 philosophy, and connections. connections. And that's, that's the first part of what I'm going to talk about now. That we cannot know what lies ahead. Maybe another boom, another bust, another whatever. Boom, bust in some quick cycles, right? But we can determine, we can decide what we stand for, how we are going to act to these. And then those convictions then guide our actions. That is how I want to see this. 
and in any kind of crisis situation or any kind of uh, uh, no, stormy seas is the analogy we always use, right? You, your ship culture is going to matter most, your org culture. What is the internal culture? What, is, what do these people stand for? And a lot of things that we accumulate, like you know, beliefs, like professionalism, all that, they don't do justice to these notions of culture, all of that. Because we look at the word professional as a, as a bundle of skills minus the human personality. I mean, classic example is uh, doctor one and doctor two should ideally give you the same treatment. There's even an ideal, some kind of an ideal held up in medicine, but it's never true, it can never be true. I know two very good doctors who actually are both very good, who believe in opposite things, about some core, core things, and they're both very good, okay? And I have very good knowledge of that. So, and they're, you know, you, and same thing, you take two very good software engineers, you ask them which kind of database, you'll set up a whole UR immediately. Or what framework to use, JavaScript framework, you'll set up a whole UR. Or what, uh, you know, what type of middleware strategy, another whole UR. And these are objective standards for software, right? You would think, you would think. In fact, I have to confess, right? I am in the company, I am one of the holy warriors myself. There are certain technologies our employees know, I would say absolute no to. <laughs> Don't even bring it to me, that kind of thing, right? So, in other words, even in matters of technology, even in matters of code, in software, as objective as you think it is, there's a lot of convictions that guide how you go about building. And then, if it's true for something as binary zeros and ones as software, then take a company culture, all of that. How can you, you know, decide that there is some kind of an objective course of action? Which is why we need philosophy, convictions, what do we stand for? Whatever the world is doing, there is something we stand for. What do we stand for? Those questions are important. What is our purpose? What is our destiny? These are important questions, I submit to you. And these cannot be built after the storm hits. You cannot get on the ocean and the storm strikes and then decide, I need the ship culture. You cannot go immediately procure one. And a lot of people, that is another mistake to make, that these are things you have to live by and be ready for whatever happens. So this is where I am going to come to a holistic philosophy of thinking about business. And that is vitally needed, particularly in our country, because we need very, very long-term businesses. We are at, what, three trillion economy. We could easily be a 30 trillion economy over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And keep in mind that it's not actually a, you cannot project that type of a growth in some kind of a linear spreadsheet. The reason is, actually a lot of the growth happens by also by currency appreciating. That is the current exchange value. In fact, uh, my good friend Harsh Gupta on Twitter, we often debate this. He actually also thinks, for example, that the rupee could appreciate in the long term from their current level. And this is what happened to all countries as they develop. And, and give you an example, Japanese yen used to be 360 yen to a dollar in 1970s. And now it's 150, but 150 is considered very bad. They used to be about 100 about six months ago. So they went from 360N to about 100N over a, literally about a 15-year period. As measured in dollar, their GDP tripled. Tripled. So Japan went from what they would have considered a middle-income economy to a highly developed economy in about 10, 15 years. That's exactly what tends to happen. And the way it happens is you develop a long-term sound technologies and the world values you suddenly. In other words, the value doesn't catch up in a linear way. It's seemingly low, 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 and then it catches up to something very big. That's how the hockey stick GDP also happens. And this requires companies that think very long term. In other words, all the rewards are, so to speak, backloaded in that sense. It doesn't happen linearly. And to stay the course, you need that type of a philosophy. 
And I, I'll point to numerous companies. TSMC is my latest favorite. TSMC is today the world's leading semiconductor company. Ten years ago, ten years ago, nobody would have thought that they will ever beat Intel. Today, not only have they beaten Intel, Intel is trying to catch up. And they may have a five-year catch-up now, if they do at all. But it's a five-year slog for Intel to catch up with TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor. And just maybe six, seven, eight years ago, people would not have believed it's possible. And TSMC has been in business since 1989, just to give you an idea. So, in other words, all of their greater success happened in the last five or six years of their 30-year existence. That doesn't mean it happened then. They built the entire foundation, and then the six years the world came to see it. That's all. It's exactly what is going to happen to Indian companies and the Indian economy as a whole, which is why it's very important to, to pay attention to all these ideas. So first I'm going to say your strategy has to be rooted in culture. You cannot separate business strategy from your org culture. And this is the holistic thinking we need to do. All too often, even if we say this, we don't realize this. We don't understand this. We, we don't pay enough attention to our culture. And we, we somehow think of strategy as somehow decoupled from our culture. And we have to now, this is increasingly visible in the post-pandemic era. The kind of supply chains we have, all that everybody understands is unviable. This model we have of business today, where there is one industry town somewhere, in China often, that supplies one kind of goods to the entire world. That model is not viable. I submit to you, it never was actually viable. It was made viable by a few confluence of factors. One, extreme Chinese mercantilism, they kept the currency too low, they kept wages too low within China, compared to their productivity. They caught up with productivity with Germany and Japan, all of these countries, but they paid too low. And then cheap energy prices that you could transport goods all over the world for very low prices. All of these factors are coming under challenge. Chinese wages cannot remain low too long because they have a huge demographic problem. Transport is not going to be trivial or cheap. And I'm not even talking about geopolitical other issues. Just purely economic fundamentals make it that you cannot have that supply chain model. So our new model of, I'm going to call this transnational localism, you have to be rooted and connected. That's the way you use it. You have to be rooted in wherever you operate, and you have to globally connect. You have to learn from everything. But you also have to stay rooted. And you have to have substantial, wherever you're operating, you have to have substantial presence. This is true. This is the model that I hope a lot of Indian companies adopt, that how we operate. We have to invent a new concept of a transnational company now. As the way it was operating before, at least in the last 20, 30 years. In some ways, this will go back to 70, 80 years ago. That we learned lessons from our previous era than the last 20, 30 years. So that's what I call the rooted and connected model. And coming to products, this is the evolution is always on, where our products are being stitched together to become platform. And which is why we intentionally use that uh, phrase, the operating system for business. Because the products now are becoming platform, and it's the platforms that give you credible value to your business. And so they work together, and they are, uh, together they are much bigger than the sum of their parts. And this is another. We, for example, in, uh, there is a notion of privacy, which everybody is now aware of, and that is also extremely useful for your phone to know everything about you, the convenience. It knows your bank accounts, it knows your uh, payment systems, it knows your books you read, it knows the video, the music you listen to, the videos you watch, the movies you like. This the phone knows. And the data you want to flow across those apps. It's convenient to pay you know, from your one click. So that means that Everything has to be integrated, but we also have this expectation of privacy. And I tell you that this is not a contradiction, think of it the right way. Privacy has to be the foundation for integration. You have to own the data, the 
apps have access the, the, the type of flow across application has to be completely governed by a framework of privacy that is still missing because you still have ad supported companies that are trying to play both both sides that we'll give you ad supported and we'll also have after we say we are not going to violate your privacy very hard to take those serious I'm going to tell you that companies have to pick one or other I'm going to be ad supported or i'm going to stand for privacy and it doesn't matter what the brand is trust me that this is where it's heading so privacy has to be born of the need for data to flow freely across applications to really give you the convenience that we want as humans at the same time protect this is the key there is a it requires a new framework thinking this will be built in baked into our cloud infrastructure it will be baked into our phones all of it and this is also important now we this again is actually an extremely this notion only in india we can appreciate the most i would say particularly the our part of india southern part we have to be confidence has to be we don't like the aggressive confidence that as is not humble and i want it to stay that way this is our cultural strength we don't want to lose it in other words we don't want to emulate rash aggressive hyper aggressive all of that we want to be confident while rooted in our tradition of humility and this is actually very important because this is the fundamental of our uh, culture here cultural root. and this also there is a pragmatic reason for the humility when our knowledge of anything knowledge of whether our economy works how medicine works or how technology works whatever it is we truly only know what we know we also know the limits of what we know that is we also have a glimpse of what we don't know if we think we know everything by definition we actually don't know anything so it is our our confidence has to be rooted in the humility for a very pragmatic reason that we will not we will not if we don't know the limits of knowledge then we are not even aware of what actually we we are on very strong ground here we are on strong ground and this is even more critical now because a lot of settled truths we accepted for a long period global consensus or what they call the washington consensus the globalization process itself all of that is coming up. those of you who follow me on twitter would have seen i now openly challenge a lot of mainstream economy practically on a weekly basis that entire profession is in tatters in other words we can abolish economics departments for the most part okay because it's it'll do the world much good but it's fake science there is nothing there i tell you i am a businessman i in fact i get paid to know economics because that's the only way i can build a global company i have to know about currencies about the dynamics how we do trading across and where the markets are evolving if i don't for example if i did not know about the financial crisis coming in 2008 9 we had done some bad moves we would have gone out of business and this is true for a lot of decisions you face day to day, to day in a multinational business so it is in a way we have skin in the game in uh, in global economy and we have you know but i worry about issues like we have actually a booming business potentially coming from kenya but they cannot pay in dollar they don't have dollars a lot of countries don't have dollar how do we resolve the problem it turns out this problem is already solved you know this is what they used to call trading companies like you so you sell stuff in kenya you buy stuff in kenya and then you bring it to another country where that stuff is needed so we sell stuff in colombia software maybe buy coffee in colombia you know what bangalore needs coffee <laughs> right this is trading the old fashion but we are heading into that world i'm telling you this might look like barter but keep in mind that uh, uh, kenya or sri lanka or colombia they don't have dollars to give and we have to figure out how to do business there actually we are seeing one of our biggest businesses is in latam and in africa and we are figuring out how to do business in fact part of our mission in dubai is to to set up all these trading networks how do we trade now we are so we are evolving from 
being pure software company also as a trading company, which I believe is going to matter in the coming world. So this is why I said, settled truths are themselves changing now. And you have to be aware of all this. And this is the point I wanted to say. It is going to challenge our economics, about industry, about geopolitics, all of it. And so we, we, we need fresh thinking, original thinking, also rooted in our ethos, our civilization, our culture. Swami Vivekananda. I am very honored to be at the University of the Vivekananda International Foundation. Really, really. So I have been actually reading, grounding myself by a lot of these things. Go on, 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 go on. This is stunning, the solidarity of the world. It's essentially a blueprint for how to build our civilization. And so it is, and, and all of that is becoming very relevant now in 2022, what he wrote in maybe 1895. In India, that is still 50 years away from independence, he laid out a blueprint for us. So I'm very, actually, was maybe one of my most uh, honored appointments is to be a trustee in the foundation, and I actually get uh, some of this thinking there. I, I listen to people, and uh, I also contribute a little bit there on what to do. And finally, this is the most, most critical thing of all. India has a message to teach the world. This, the two things that our spirituality teaches us. One is humility, the other is contentment. The word contentment, all mainstream economists will dismiss it as in GDP. Consumption drives GDP. They'll keep telling you this, right? Consumption drives GDP. Well, if every one of our villagers, every one of our, everyone, every Indian consumes like an average American, the earth is finished, completely finished. There's no hope. I don't even know where you will put all the cars. Imagine that Indians have 2.5 cars per capita. 2.5 cars per capita. Where will you put the cars? So our population density, right? It's true. I mean, I'm asking all these questions. In other words, we have to ask all these because sometimes the economists who make those implicit assumptions are the ones who are telling you this policy or that policy. And so we have to have a notion of prosperity that is rooted in contentment. Again, this will look like a contradiction to every academic economist there. How can you have prosperity with contentment? Right? But I'm telling you, I submit to you, this is the balance we have to strike. Prosperity that is rooted in. And because we are Mother Earth, we're not separate from it. And this is actually, in fact, this morning I wrote about this. So I, I look at our own village, our farms, all of it, how much diesel we consume. Just to produce food. Just to produce food. So these are some of the issues now, urgently, that require all our attention. And finally, we also have this notion of learning by doing and teaching by uh, learning by teaching, teaching by learning, learning by doing, all of this. So we actually make some of our employees become faculty, or the faculty also uh, uh, go and volunteer in teams later, and of course the students are doing projects to learn. This is our Zoho Schools of Learning. And this is our latest uh, thing there, uh, Marubadi, again in Tamil. We launched this to boot camp for women who left the workforce who are coming there in Chennai a few months ago. So this again, I'm saying this, you know, the Western idea is business is separate, philanthropy is separate, and Bill Gates exemplified the notion you can be a, a very hard-nosed evil businessman and day and then you can go donate and buy your respectability at night, right? I say that's a bullshit notion. These things have to go together. We have to teach a different way here. These things have to go together. So this is the whole thing that we, our purposes have to drive our action. All respect. What is our purpose? What is our destiny? That has to drive. And for us, we are making extremely strong investments in R&D, and I'll just highlight a few of them. This is everything that Zoho has written on our own cloud. The entire stack we control, 
other than just a hardware layer and the OS that is, of course, Linux in there. Everything else we write ourselves, and we are actually expanding it further. Maybe in three, four, five years, I don't know when, the CC never predict time in Zoho, should be writing a custom OS too. And a very fast database, we actually return a lot of database code that runs on GPU. And this is actually, if you know the, understand the technology, this gives us a 20x speed up for the same resource, same infrastructure. And all of that translates into better performance and also lower cost for us, so we pass on the savings to you. And a complete security stack. But we have invested heavily in security. We are probably one of the most advanced security teams here now. And anti-spam, fraud detection, phishing, all of this, anti-phishing, all of this we have made investment. And this is actually something that has come up in the last two years alone. The pandemic struck, we were actually trained in the audio video. Well, we didn't know. We are not really working from home. So we weren't, you know, too much into the video calls yet. Well, the two years, two and a half years, we have caught up. And now our framework is second to none, implementing across products. We are also going to open it up so that your own custom applications, all that can use it across everything that we do. And this is something very interesting. One of our uh, key engineers actually, he discovered this. Not something this, people have known this, but we rediscovered this idea. That to translate between Indian languages, go through Sanskrit. So Sanskrit is used as a machine language to intermediate language. And we are finding that this actually works better than going through English or any other. So, interesting approach we are taking now. And we also are, you will see a lot more of this in the next month with maybe a session. Now, our browser, now of course in Tamil, you know, travel sir. So, we have a browser coming up, very privacy for Just from my machine, I took this part. So, you have all these modes. You have a personal mode, you have a developer mode. Developer mode, you have to have, right? We are a software company. Of course, your usual kids mode you have if you are a parent and modes we have. Each with a separate identity so that they never mix separate set of cookies all that. Your developer mode and your personal mode and all that won't mix up. And all this is possible because we have a culture that nurtures talent. We have people who have been with us 25 years now, 26 years, that's, a, that's the company has been around. Then 20 years, 18 years, 17 years, all that. This was in 2021, the highest attrition was 8.5%. We actually consider it high. I think we'll, this year will probably come down to 7. Next year, it will be 5%, which is our, our long term average tends to be about 5%. And we are expanding our support and services worldwide now. In fact, a lot of our expansion now is in for support, services, because we realize worldwide, also in India, that increasingly with all this complex technology, customers need a lot more. So we are planning this expansion. Our next 2x from 11,000 employees now to maybe each 20, 25,000, more than 40, 50 percent will be. Next big growth is coming here. And integration I mentioned as our key differentiation across our products, why we call the Zoho one the operating system. And that platform evolution, breadth, depth, customizability, ecosystem. What is amazing now is, was an event in Indonesia, I spoke remotely, and 1,000 people. And there are events in, uh, we had in uh, Germany, in Netherlands, in UK, all down in Canada. So we are seeing these now those so rapidly becoming a global phenomenon now. Pace at which it's growing. That is why we are scrambling to keep up with all the services, support, all these options. And we are going to do all this while we continue to stay private. Because the only way we can do what we do is by, by staying private. And if you, a year, year and a half ago, that looks sketchy because you are no, your stock prices got 30x, 50x, 100x, 500x revenue. And those companies will be spending money 
I mean, there are categories where we'll spend a million dollars in marketing, somebody will come in and spend 200 million. How do you compete, right? But it's all done now. And this is why we chose to be private. It gives us the freedom and luxury, to, including where I choose to live. And all of that is not possible if you are not private. I mean, I love to be on Wall Street or conference calls and all the time with analysts, all that. Now I only report to our employees and our customers. Very, very liberating. And not only are we doing a lot of R&D, we are investing heavily in R&D. There are, I'll highlight these companies. B Titan is our medical instruments company, which has uh, just, we ship 200 of those syringe pumps. Once they give you IV, this is based in Chennai. Signal chip is, of course, Bangalore. They launched, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi ji launched the first call, first 5G call, Indian chip in it, just about three weeks ago. Zentron Labs, and Krishnan might be here. Krishnan, are you there? Yeah. There's Zentron Labs in Bangalore. Machine Vision Solutions. He's shipping product for uh, you know, the form inspection of fruits, inspection of uh, parts, all of that by applying machine vision. And it will then accept or reject based on visual inspection. Very high speed. It happens that, you know, the machine need to watch, watch the videos. Voxel Grids, MRI machines also Bangalore. So those three signal chips, Zentron, Voxel Grid are all here in Bangalore. Gen Robotics, this is in Trivandrum. And they, this is my favorite company because they solve a real problem that our country needs, called the manual scavenger. They have a solution for this. It is now deployed in about 200 towns across India. It actually started in Kumbhagonam, near my birthplace. First manual scavenging, robotic scavenger. And this company is profitable already. They're actually quite well. And recently they launched, I was in Trivandrum two weeks ago, to launch their uh, next product, which is for the quadriplegics to do the walking training. It's a kind of an exoskeleton, kind of a robotic exoskeleton you wear and you all. So these young people are solving really, really. And there's many more, actually. All of them are instant health mode, and of course, I'm visiting ultraviolet motorcycle that coming out. We are building a factory now. I think the factory is being built. In but the company is here in Bank MB afternoon tomorrow. So I'll give you a glimpse of what lies ahead from a global perspective. One, this, those of you who follow me on Twitter, this is not a surprise. You see a major financial and an economic Colossal debt burdens that wants to work, and that is West, Japan, and China. All three. Same problem extreme levels of debt, demographic implosion, and uh, now potentially currency collapse. And this picture is Japanese yen, the five year chart. You can go back 20 year chart, it will look the same way, except that the hockey stick will be compressed. But it was 100, about 100 yen. For a long time, I got used to thinking of uh, Japanese yen like a one cent, US cent. 100 yen is a dollar kind of. I'll make a mental calculation for revenue that way. Just shift to zeros, right? 150 now. All in the last just about three, four months. No end in sight. They are intervening heavily. The Japanese Bank of Japan, their central bank, has burned through about 100 billion dollars in reserves. They have over a trillion dollars in reserves, but they've burned through 100 billion trying to defend the currency. And the collapse is doing no right. So this is in. And uh, you all have uh, seen the Bank of England. Why uh, Sunak became prime minister, you all know the history, why it happened, why the previous prime minister resigned. And we used to call of them hot currencies. Actually, the rupee is much stronger now than what all these currencies are, which is again something to us Indians, the surprise, right? Why is the rupee holding up when the yen is collapsing like this and uh, the severe crisis in England, all of this? And I submit to you, it is all very basic. Our demographics is good, getting things right now more and more. We are getting our act together economically. 
our you know more and more it, it always you can take two modes of thought always be complaining but we can also see the positive side of how much things are coming up and those of you in bangalore i'm sure the infrastructure was but for me the only solution for that we have to do we cannot bring in more and more and people we cannot bring another 10 million people here and hope to just hold up an infrastructure so this is why i recommend that people go as far we have a nice office in salem now we have paimathur we are open and we are actually in karnataka we are we are planning but definitely not in bank else you don't need more cars here <laughs> and this is this early morning 3:30 i tweeted this 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 is because where i live i notice it just extremely how dependent we are on diesel if diesel stops to our villages production will stop stop because everything is dependent on diesel tractors cannot harvest now crops and uh, of course cannot transport food and then the next immediate one every household every household including in the villages gas out so these two are our huge dependents why i tweeted this is there is a thread about saudi arabia saying that could be running into diesel issues problems they are giving us a early warning to everyone in the world that they are the major producer right so these are the and these problems are not going to go away these are, these are not like temporary, temporary blips it's going to keep sailing, sailing again and it's and hard it's hard work hard thinking hard, hard, hard choices choice we made we made to we think a lot a lot of social so that's what i keep what coming to coming to and we have to be aware that technology industry including software saas all of that because we cannot eat saas or we cannot transport saas so we have to you know global issues we are not immune and i am an optimist i assure you i am an optimist only an optimist will invest in all of these right they are investing in chips and mri machines all of that so i'm not an optimist i'll not do anything but i want the optimism grounded in realism not wishful thinking we have to be aware of what the problems the world faces we have to think about solutions for example i am looking at what can we do with solar right now and we are digging ponds so that we don't need to spend so much on pump sets to get ground water it's bad for other reasons too we need lot more ponds so all of these we are trying to do similarly biogas what can we do for biogas all of these we have to think through and all of us and i one thing that i tell our employees about 1000 of them have done it go buy a small farm start doing some of it sustainable way that is going to matter educated people should think about this problem and not think somebody else will solve this this whole idea that somebody else will solve this is a real pernicious we have to realize that in our society in a democracy we are the problem solver we have to be at the fore and so these are the things summarized in a strong culture sense of purpose investment in our long term r&d on every area when farming requires r&d now how to grow without all this diesel what do we do how to achieve productivity without so much expenditure of energy and humility to learn lessons taught by reality we we have to be grounded in humility we are going to have a you know, lot of our uh, assumptions question challenged so we have to be humble to learn that and as for our company itself we want to stand by our employees and our customers being a life raft filter during whatever that lies ahead. and this is one last thing i'm, I'm going to offer you as a business lesson this trap is what our farmers are on costly inputs commodity out diesel is costly fertilizer is costly seeds are costly and they produce then what they get is a commodity for so as one farmer told me this actually came from one of our farmers in the village he said we go to the store to buy anything they they name the price when i go to sell my produce they name the price right so simple there is a huge economics lesson in that one one statement who gives you the price do you set the price or do they set the price so and this is a trap for many companies too actually a lot of manufacturing companies are in the trap 
where the customers have this, uh, they will allocate a tiny margin for you. I am very familiar with the Coimbatore Tirupur industrial belt. A lot of manufacturers that their customers will tell them essentially, I'll pay you this 30 cents or 20 cents margin for the day. And they find that after you pay up the labor, you pay the rent and you pay the, all the bills, electricity bill, all of that, they have negative margin off. But they have to keep the factories running so they swallow hard and often do this. And when inflation hits, this is a very bad trap because the costly inputs strangle you. And the margins get compressed. And I would secular, you know, on secular terms, I would generally expect inflation to be a persistent headache for a, for a while. So this is the solution to this. Quality output from affordable input. Actually, we are doing it in our form where we are created our own seed form now. We are trying to, of course, our own fertilizer from uh, cow dung to all of the local stuff. We actually even purchase from a nearby power station the burn the rice uh, rice husk, and we buy that because that has a lot of uh, minerals in it, and we mix it with cow dung for our. Uh, those tend to be cheap. So quality output from affordable input. So I'm going to call it. Why am I doing all that? Because I told you that the food is not a solved problem. Don't assume it's a solved problem. That food, like a lot of you know, kids think food comes from the fridge. Not a solved problem. <laughs> so thank you. So with this, I'm going to open up for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Shridhar. Um, questions? You can put your hand up. Wow. OK. Yes. Wonderful session, sir. Thank you. Uh, great. I always I keep following you in all the stuff. You quite a bit videos I've seen. Uh, I know you, you're trying to change the sh paradigm shift way people are thinking. But what do you think the best? How they or how they are going to react to this? Because nowadays we we want change, and and there is a everybody. The, the, if you look at it, the rich they say, okay, I want the poor to grow, but at the end of the day, he will also suppress the poor. So how do you think the geopolitical? I what I suspect what happened in. Uh... UK is instructive, and what is happening in Japan is instructive. We are rapidly arriving at a stage where no one is in control. This is the situation spinning out of control. That's where we seem to be heading. Japan is worth watching, because what is happening to Japanese yen is a serious warning. Japan is a big exporter, technologically very advanced nation, but demographically extremely poor. 11 million homes that are empty. Population declined for the last 10 years. And this is, of course, Germany, France. A lot of countries face the same problem. Italy could be a next. So I'd watch all these carefully. Once these things gain sufficient momentum, it may be unstoppable. So, and then each country for itself. We saw a little bit of that during the pandemic, which is why India has to really look at you know, how are we going to be self-reliant for basic food, most important. Fertilizer, diesel. Because it's not food, it's fertilizer and diesel today. So how are we going to solve those problems? These are the questions for us. Of dollars. They accept or they may. At least Saudi Arabia, there is now a deal being worked out, I guess, to pay in rupees, which means they will buy stuff from us. So it's mutual, right? They'll buy from us and we'll buy from them. There could be a lot of these bilateral deals being done. I also mentioned the trading companies idea. So trading companies are doing balance of payments internally. In other words, if we sell a lot in, say, Kenya, there is no option but to buy a lot from Kenya. Because how else are we going to monetize that? We have no way to get money out. They, don't, they have nothing else to give us. So they will say, buy something from us. We have to decide what we can buy in Kenya that we can sell elsewhere. That could be in India. So those, those kind of ideas will spread. Which is why a lot of these trading companies are going to come into being. My expectation now. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. You. At the front.
being a very good role model and think way, way, way beyond the evaluations which really goes on the PR. And really interesting to see that how do you put it. Uh, I have a very, very basic question as a founder of a small Martech company. That when it was 1996, thought about it coming to Coinbase and uh, came, came, coming to Coinbase, started with it. Uh, when you see today, the hype is absolutely beyond the rooftop and it's all about evaluations, it's all about this. And today when we think about getting started with Bootstrap, yeah. it absolutely feels like it is worthless. We are not going to win the war because there are already people yeah. who are already fighting this. Standing here, like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll please, stop you and I'll tell sure. you. Who Thank come you. to Tenkasi, spend three days, you'll never see a word about any of the hype. You go to, you know, uh, after this event, after Mumbai event, I'm actually going to Varanasi. And I'm going to Eastern UP. No, there is nobody worries about valuation in any of those places. I tell you, there are 200 million people in UP. There's another 50 million people in Bihar. These are all untapped territory. You want to completely avoid all this. In other words, there is a cheat. What is, whatever was true in 96 in Chennai is true in Tenkasi today. The kids look the same to me. Actually, I, sit, I look at my rural kids and I look, oh, these kids look exactly like I used to be as a boy when I was their age. <laughs> it's the same kind of mindset. So that's why I'm saying there's a way to cheat. Cheat this reality, go somewhere else. <laughs> that's something I'm just telling you. Travel about 200 kilometers outside of Bangalore. You'll see a different reality. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Game room, I follow you on okay. most platforms. Um, sir, uh, mention about uh, your customers not being able to pay dollars and trading. This is similar to butter and yeah. we have the problem of coincidence. Uh, see, concept no. Uh, really see. Yes, no, that's a, a there is a technological solution to what is now seen as a dollar shortage. A dollar shortage is like alcohol shortage. There will never be enough alcohol, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's what it is. That's what dollar shortage is. The world is so heavily indebted in dollars, there's a perpetual shortage. They can never print enough. So in that sense, the, the, the digital currency idea is a technological fix to the problem. But there is a real world problem. The real problem is, take Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is an economic problem. Everybody knows yes, what the yes. problem is. They still need software to run their business. They still need technologies. They need smartphones. But how, what do they pay with? They're going to say, hey, we have lots of tea, or we have lots of this, or we have tourism. Can you bring some tourists to our island? In other words, they are going to throw the problem to you and say, please help us solve this problem, because we cannot pay you. But if there is something here maybe you can buy from us, right? That is what trading companies solve for them. And this comes from the Bitcoin idea, right? True. I, see, I, I look at these two ways. There's a financial part, but every financial uh, arrangement has to be rooted in some real world arrangement. I look at peer behind the finance and look at the real world arrangement. What is the reality? What is the reality for Sri Lanka? They need to buy stuff from diesel to smartphones. What do they sell? That's how I think about it. And this is the same problem in a Tenkasi, actually. If you look at any of our rural districts, it is the same problem. We need all this. We need our motorcycles. We need uh, smartphones. We need MRI machines. We go for a scan. But what do we pay in return? And that problem has to be solved that is independent of whatever technology of currency or finance you come up with. Because eventually it only means more debt. And we have, the only durable solution is they have to be able to sell something in order to buy something. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you, thank you. We are overshooting uh, the session, so we'll allow for two more questions. Please stick to one question each person. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, for the I'm from Coimbatore, healthcare. So producing more. Healthcare, uh, Underutilization, wastage. I find thirty percent uh, all the areas, whether it is health or food industry yes. area. Focus first on reducing waste, cutting waste, rather than produce more. I think uh, Zoho is a 
Yeah, we, for example, in our, uh, in our kitchens everywhere, every day we announce the amount of food that is wasted. <laughs> the amount of food that is thrown from your plate. We tell our employees, take as much you need, but don't waste it. Those are some things. And similarly, I, no, the other thing is, people who are affluent have to adopt simpler lifestyles. Because the affluent people are setting the standard for other people. Now, if you are going to spend, you know, five crore on a wedding because I have the money, well, you are going to put pressure on the next person to come up with five crores even if they don't have the money. So these are all things we have to do. These have to be a cultural movement and not just, this is not just an economic issue, social, cultural issue. All these are going to be forced by reality on us. The reality of energy prices, all of them. Hi, Sridhar. Akshay. Hey. So we work with a lot of uh, non-profits or grassroots mm -hmm. uh, organizations to enable them with technology. And one of the things that we've seen is really, like we leverage Zoho a lot. And one of the things that is clearly evident is, you know, like people need to come together, either be it technology platforms or be it, you know, platform frameworks need to So my question is, has Zoho really thought of, you know, open sourcing some of those microservices or, you know, like some of the R&D which is yeah. being done, which could be used, potentially used to solve real problems, yeah. right? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, we are, actually we have a, but an internal frameworks we have used for a long time. Only reason they were not opened up is because I didn't think anybody would be interested. See, for long periods, our own engineers would think what we do is uncool. <laughs> they didn't realize it's actually very good. There was a lot of humility there, right? It's actually, in fact, it's part of the for Indian problem too. Our engineers are often very, very humble, extremely humble. They'll say, who will need this? Or they'll say, well, they allow to document this. And often this is, you know, oral tradition. <laughs> Those are the issues, but we will do it. One last question from there. Yes. Hi, Sridhar. Thanks for uh, meeting us. Where is, where is, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. My hand. Oh, okay. Thanks for motivating us. Uh, we are a Zoho partner from Hyderabad. Started off with three people. Yeah. We are a small organization. I just wanted to know from you what would you indicate? Because as a small company, we are going organic. We are struggling to have good. Can you suggest organic? Well, well, you know, if you, if you first of all, that was going to have a choice. Then you may not have a choice. Nobody gives you money, 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 then you want to look that gift horse in the mouth and you ask, is it going to really help us grow in a sustainable way or are we going to spend money freely that may not make it back easily? So those are the questions to ask. I'd say you are in Coimbatore, you said, where? Hyderabad, okay. So I'd say you also look at smaller towns. Look, we need to take all these jobs also to our, to our population in the interior. See, I, look, I know the district, our district very well. I traveled all around. I know every small town, I know a lot of the villages. There's just so much untapped potential. In my very village, which is a very remote village, Panchayat, about population two, we have about 10 kids in the high school. And now in the school, high school kids are about 10. Two or three, I think, could potentially join Zoho. And I'm watching them every day and I'm seeing how they are learning all that. That's a high hit rate when you think about it. For a random rural high school in a remote village, that these kids would not in a million years have thought of Zoho, I can see that there's two or three kids who join us. So those are, there are a lot of talent there, but we have to do this. We have to go there and, and find them. Because they will, not, they will not even know. Most of our kids in our village, for example, the district headquarters is Tenkasi, which is about 26 kilometers away. Most kids have not even visited the district. Leave alone Madurai, which is 120 kilometers away. Chennai, which is 650 kilometers away. None of this they have seen. And a lot of 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds in our school, they are, their first train ride they are going to take now. First time they are getting on a train. All this is true in our own villages in all of these places. Still. So which is why I am saying that there is a lot of, and how much talent is there in those places. I want to think about it. That's what I am I'm most excited about. Thank you. Just Thank one you. final question. Just one last, yes. Vanakam, sir. Yeah. Ignesh, to say I'm a developer. So you have talked about my 
second day we think of it. You are, you are trying to trap me in all the political hot water now. I, for a long, okay, I'll give you my, look, I am a gold bug, right? I, I actually believe that gold is valuable in a, when there is currency collapse, all that. In other words, if you are Japanese, you want to protect your money against the hyperinflation that could be ahead, I would trust gold first. And maybe agricultural land where you can grow crop, crops on. Because you need food and you need long-term savings or insurance, gold. A lot of people think Bitcoin would serve that purpose. I am, you know, it spends a lot of energy doing the computation to validate the transaction, right? Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is the ledger of all the transactions that became part of the Bitcoin, kind of a self reference But I am not completely persuaded because it costs a lot of energy. Now there is a thing called Lightning Network that has come up that bunches up the transactions so that don't spend energy per transaction like this. I am still not persuaded because you still need the global network for this to retain its value. And during times of crisis, as an example, why won't a government just simply block all the network? It happens in many countries, it's not like it has never happened. Then what is your Bitcoin worth? On the other hand, you have a bar of gold, you have some jewelry, so very few governments are going to confiscate that. Definitely not in India because it's a religious issue. So I think that is why I would put my money on gold. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Thank you so you. much, Sridhar. Thank, thank you. you. I know a lot of thank others you. have questions too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you just wanted to say thank you. All of this honors us, but we don't have time to take more questions. So we're moving 